You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast. Over the years, I've been able to raise over 250 billion naira over the last five years. Myself and a group of others are building what we call a transparency platform called AgroVerified. And you need to understand that business to be able to structure a package that will allow the business owners have access to funding. With that, we'll be able to manage to a large extent the reputational damage that has occurred in the agricultural sector in Nigeria. Stay tuned as we bring you inspiring people who are unlocking Africa's economic potential. You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast with your host, Tessa Adamu. Welcome to the Unlocking Africa podcast, where we find amazing people who are doing amazing things to unlock Africa's economic potential. Today, we have Victoria Mededor, who is Head of Business Development in Agribusiness for the Bank of Industry, also co-founder of Agri Verified. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the podcast, Victoria. How are you? Good afternoon, Tessa. I'm very well, thank you. It's great to have you on the podcast. I'm glad to be here. So you wear several different hats professionally, so I was hoping you could tell us a bit more about yourself. So please introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about who Victoria is. Okay, thank you so much. I am currently working with Nigerian government, a subsidiary of the Bank of Industry called BI Investment and Trust, as the group head um, business development. My basic core is to do a lot of fundraising activities for businesses in the real sector power and oil and gas. That's my major focus. Over the years, I've been able to raise over 250 billion naira over the last five years. Oh, wow. 250 billion naira. Wow. Yes, as a group. Um, And potentials that we've seen in the agricultural sector, we have successfully done almost 100 billion in the last three years. So the growth in the sector has actually helped us to grow as a business in the bank. I also have a not-for-profit organization called the African Farmer Stories, where we tell the resilience, grace, and innovative stories of farmers in Africa. This was as a result of the pandemic, where other sectors were being praised in their role to help people cope with the pandemic. And those in the agricultural sector were not as recognized as they ought to be. So we started the campaign to help showcase the strength and contribution of farmers. Most of the agripreneurs suffered a lot of losses because their products are highly perishable. So even though their products are the first to leave the supermarket and retail outlets shelves, but they were not also given as much recognition during the pandemic. Um, currently, myself and a group of others are building a what we call a transparency platform called AgroVerified. It is a repository of verified farmers in Nigeria. We currently have 400,000 farmers, of which we have successfully verified 37,000 of those farmers. Um, hopefully in July, we will officially launch that so that people who want to invest in the agricultural sector in Nigeria are able to know who they are discussing with and verify if they have the capacity that they claim to have or if they have any fraudulent activities associated with their name as individual or the product that they claim to champion. 
Brilliant. So you've kind of given us a beautiful overview of, you know, the potential and growth in the agriculture sector. Also your work in your not-for-profit organization and the platform that you're currently working on. So if we can kind of go a bit more deeper in terms of you personally, can you tell us a bit more about your journey into the world of agriculture in Africa? Okay, um, so I did my first degree in agriculture, economics, and extension service. I have a diploma in data processing, and I actually wanted to continue as a computer scientist. Unfortunately, but now fortunately, I had to study agriculture, economics, and extension service. I then joined the Bank of Industry Group as a Treasury Officer um, after working with Shell and United Global Resources for about three years with Shell as a contract staff and with United Global Resources as a program manager. However, when I joined the bank, I realized that a lot of the agribusinesses were not paid attention to. Um, if they are not specifically doing things like um, products that have a longer shelf life. Yes. However, products that didn't have that much long shelf life, like their poultry meat, eggs, that the shelf life is much more short and has a lot of um, regulatory controls over they were not really interested. So I, I worked with um, the then, ag, it was called the Agribusiness Desk, but now split into two. The then Agribusiness Desk um, as um, the first project, we worked on the first project together for a company that is into poultry production, um, poultry meat and egg production to raise um, a total of 5 billion naira. And that was the very first interest I drew in, in the sector again after leaving the university. And I saw the, the beauty in the sector, the dynamics that it brings to fundraising. You, it's not a straight jacket structure that you have that you can you can you can have in your power or in in other real sector fundraising drive. And yes. I began to pick more interest to go into the field to understand the sector um, in its integrity and the peculiarities that comes with um, raising funds for them. What, what do I need to understand about this business, this particular sector? If we're looking at, um, say, sesame seed exports, what are the things I need to look at? Because the funding dynamics is totally different from what you will get um, when you're talking about the poultry sector or when you're talking about the cocoa sector. Um, in the, and they're all agriculture or, or termed agribusinesses, but they have different funding dynamics. And you need to understand that business to be able to structure a, a package that will allow the business owners have access to funding. So it's been a journey of about 15 years, um, but I'd say it's been a rewarding one between micro businesses and um, the large corporates in, in raising funds for them across different fund owners. Fantastic. So you've detailed your journey into agriculture in Africa and gave us an insight into what you do as head of business development in agribusiness for the Bank of Industry and also touched upon your role as co-founder at 
Agri Verified. So I was wondering if you could tell us, in terms of those two roles, can you tell us how they both complement each other and work together in terms of what you do? Okay, so um, as a co-founder for Agro Verified, I saw the need to start a platform that will help in fundraising and unlocking access to funding and investment as a whole, not just funding, investment as a whole in the agricultural sector in Nigeria because of the peculiarities and the risk that is associated in funding the agricultural sector in Nigeria. Over the years, I have seen a trend emerge from lack of access to fund to too much access to fund okay. um, in the sector. So about six or seven years ago, the crowdfunding platform came into Nigeria, yes. where it unlocked faster access to funding for agropreneurs. Now, when it came in as an innovative funding instrument, it was highly welcomed, both by investors and existing agripreneurs, because it helped to raise quick working capital funding and improve their access to cash flow for business owners. However, the return on investments that were promised to investors became the undoing of that disruptive innovation in the sector. And it became a high risk element for investors and also an integrity issue for the country as a whole. Because a lot of people, according to the media and the analysis given by the Security and Exchange Commission, in year 2020, we had over 40 billion Naira loss in that crowdfunding platform. Oh, wow. Um, from different crowdfunding platforms that collapsed. More crowdfunding platforms are collapsing as the day goes by. In 2021 alone, we've seen three crowdfunding platforms gone down with billions of Naira gulped down the drain with it. Now, AgroVerified is to help, to a large extent, nip this um, risk in the board both for the traditional fund owners and for investors to find out. Most times, people are too scared to go to the rural areas of Nigeria because of security concerns, because of um, distance, travel time, right, and barrier, language barrier. Yes. Those are the the, the based on our market research, those were the critical things that made a lot of investors not to do more KYC um, on investments. So for AgroVerified, it allows you to say this person is, um, you can remotely see the farm land based on the Joe tags that have been um, pegged for each of those farmlands to say this farmland actually exists and it, it's actually owned by this or operated by this um, person. And the capacity based on artificial intelligence, you can then see the historicals of the farm, of the farmland to say these were the, the output, the yields, per hectare or this particular farmland over the period of three years. And based on those historicals, you can decide to invest or not to invest. And you can also say, okay, based on these historicals, the claims of this entrepreneur are right or are wrong without necessarily discussing it with the entrepreneur or paying so much money for um, private investigators to confirm those figures um, for you on site. Secondly, on AgroVerified, you, when you invest or into a particular agropreneur or a, an entrepreneur, and the entrepreneur defaults either in providing you, supplying you with the with the products based on your contracts 
or the fault in repaying based on the return on investment promised, you can actually report them on AgroVerified on one of our products called the Agro Bureau. Then it allows people to know the integrity of that individual or that particular parcel of land. If so many people have posed with that parcel of land as theirs to, to um, attract investment to themselves for dubious reasons. So with that, we'll be able to manage to a large extent the reputational damage that has occurred in the agricultural sector in Nigeria, and then bring back some level of trust and um, transparency and traceability into the sector and manage the risk to the barest minimum. We cannot say we will zero it out, but then it helps with decision making and gives a, so, some level of comfort um, to, to investors. Brilliant, brilliant. So, I mean, you've touched upon in terms of some of the difficulties regarding return on investment from crowdfunding platforms and also the functionality of AgriVerified. If we could delve deeper into AgriVerified, can you expand on how you went about determining that there was a need for such a platform? Okay, so... Um... Because I am an agricultural advocate, a lot of challenges that occur in the agri sector always come to me for, um, please, can you verify the story? Um, can you investigate this for us? Or even request for access to commodities okay. in Nigeria. We would like to partner with, we're, we're sourcing for cutting. There was someone who was sourcing for 15,000 tons of cutting from Nigeria and um, wanted to know who to speak with. Or you're sourcing for any commodity. A lot of people send referrals to me and trust that, okay, I will know people in the ecosystem that can provide them with that kind of service. Now, instead of providing individuals um, with that kind of service, if they have a repository where they can go to and then source their commodities themselves and identify the people they can work with, it makes it easier and faster for them to take that business decision or take um, facilitates that trade within the shortest period of time, then the turnaround time becomes better and they can also monitor where they are investing their money into to get that commodity out of Nigeria or within Nigeria. However, we carried a market research in 2021 post the very dreadful stage of the pandemic to actually see what gap exists other than the crowdfunding platform failures that we keep getting daily. We also have issues with data. If you yes. go onto the World Bank FAO stats, after getting your data, it also says there's always a comment, at the, a fine print that says, although these data are not verified, right? <laughs> yes, very true. I mean, for a country this big, with so much activities in the agricultural sector, we should be able to have some level of trusted data. But with a verified, with a repository that is dynamic. Now we have database, but they are static database. So un unless they go back into the fields to keep collecting, which is quite expensive, we will not get updated information. But with artificial intelligence, we are able to collect the data once and we have been able to find means to keep updating our database every four months and keeps it that keeps it dynamic to so make it trusted. So when a, a farmer migrates, we're able to tell to a large extent that that farmer is no longer in that location. And hopefully over a period of time, we will gain market confidence in a way whereby the farmers are now the one willing 
to give those information for us to use our inter artificial intelligence to then determine um, whether it is correct or not. These are some of the reasons. And also we notice in, in Nigeria and in Africa, most part of Africa, actually, subsidies are politicalized. So it then does not get to the very bottom of the rural poor. And even when market needs analysis are being done, it takes longer than necessary a time. You see, market needs analysis will take three to four months for it to be concluded. But with a, a, a repository of um, data, you can then call up data to confirm the trend that is ongoing in the country and make your need analysis in two, two weeks maximum. You're able to then decide what you want to do and what interventions you want to give either as a multilateral agency, a donor agency, or as a government as a well, whole and use a tokenized system to provide those intervention through token and you're sure it is getting to the um, rural poor. And also you're sure you can monitor their progress remotely and also tell your, don your, your donors or investors that they can monitor this investment um, remotely um, in a cluster on the, the platform. Fantastic. So you discussed your involvement or, you know, people approaching you to source services and commodities and also the importance of data with regards to agriculture. So I was wondering if we could discuss that a bit further. So with regards to AgriVerified, so how do you go about verifying if the people who are approaching you are genuine? And also from a different perspective, how do you verify whether or not people such as the farmers are the true owners of the land? Okay, so um, that, to a large extent, is a trade secret, but however... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't want you to divulge any trade secrets, so please don't. Uh, but in summary, we're using artificial intelligence to determine the output, the yield of the farmers, rather than asking them for their output. Um, and we do tag each farmer, then use our algorithm to determine a lot. Um, for the land we um, verification, the ownership, we've also found a way around it um, using some mechanisms that allows us to get details of the farmers. And on our platform, we try as much as possible to have a responsibility officer that um, takes ownership of a particular set of um, data so that if there's any challenge, it's easy for us to trace back and know where it is coming from. Fantastic. I mean, data is key, especially from the context of doing business in Africa. What I was going to ask next is, with regards to the platform, are you seeing a large amount or majority of your users, are they local or international customers? Um, because we are launching in, officially in July, those that have indicated interest largely are international um, users. Um, most of them want to use it to carry out um, analysis on the market trends, um, pricing, and also um, to help with advising on investments in, in Nigeria for commodity trading and um, for fundraising. Those are the users we have, the interest that we have seen so far from the international side. However, locally, we've also gotten some level of strong indication of usage when we launch. 
We are going through the pilot phase now. We've, we've done the first round of testing with 200 poultry farmers. We are about to go through the second round of testing. Um, the first round was on the fund, funding side to see how the farmers perform. We saw that we didn't have, um, through the fund that the microfinance bank we worked with, we didn't have any default from the, the poultry farmers that we worked with. So we are starting our second round of testing um, to see on the insurance side, how it impacts the insurance sector before we go on to the commodity side. By the time we finish with all of this um, testing and, and re-engineering, we will then launch hopefully in July to the open market. Um, then we can give specific statistics on usage and um, markets. So you mentioned there that you have started with testing in the area of poultry farming. So I was wondering if we can kind of keep on that theme for now, because you have a lot of experience with poultry farming, which I guess is an area of agriculture, which we are seeing rising costs to commodities such as corn, which is used to feed poultry. How can technology be used to mitigate some of these challenges, do you feel? Okay, so in the poultry sector, there's a lot of disruption that has come into the sector that also helps with managing feed consumption um, and improving um, feed conversion for the, for the birds. So one of them is a technology that um, FarmSpeak is a local technology um, built by um, some young guys in Nigeria called Farm Speak. They help, it helps with disease detection. Now, some of the times uh, and water intake, some of the times a lot of feed are wasted by the birds because of either they are sick or they do not take enough water. So okay. you are trying to feed them more so that they can quickly convert the feed to a better body uh, mass, better weight. But if they are sick, then you will feed more and you will not get the, the, the weight that you require as, as at when you. So they have come up with an IoT that helps with disease detect detection, um, weather impact on the birds, and also water intake. With that, they're able to, they have been able to do some demonstrations that has helped reduce the cost of um, production and um, feed consumption to, a mini, they've reduced it by almost 25%. We are currently carrying a study on that um, to confirm their claim. We should be done with that research work anytime from the month of May. And um, the article will be out. Also, the kind of cages that are now used in Nigeria has helped with feed intake. So you have them eating instead of the wastage that we have occur in the in the in the in pen the old structure of penthouses, you are able to maximize the space and force the birds to eat um, almost all the feed on the on the feeding trough. Brilliant. And in a, in a way that keeps the feed the feed still warm and the aroma is still there to attract the birds. Um, however, what we have done as AgroVerified is to provide the farmers um, in collaboration with Full Rain Microfinance Bank uh, to provide the farmers with a um, low interest rate funding for their feed um, Purchase, and this helped them 
significantly because what they would have gotten as cost of funding is about 5% per month. But what it was extended by Full Rain Microfinance Bank because they can remotely monitor the cost of monitoring and evaluation and collection was significantly reduced using the platform. They were able to use 1.2% per month as against the industry um, range of 5% per month as cost of input um, for these farmers. And we saw 100% repayment from the farmers. So if we have with, with platforms like AgroVerify, a lot of um, funders, um, financial institutions will have more confidence to fund the, the agri space and um, also the volatility of the risk of farmers just going into abeyance will then be reduced significantly and give the funders confidence to fund more um, in the sector. I hope that answers your question. Oh, it's answered it fantastically because you've gone into great detail and given insight into some of the new technologies used in a range of areas of poultry farming. We've also seen technology being used very effectively within the commodity space with platforms such as Afex. Can you give us an overview of how some of these commodity platforms work? Okay, so um, Afex has a platform called Comex where commodities are being traded. They are approved by the Security and Exchange Commission. They, in fact, Afex are the first to provide um, invoice warehouse receipting system for farmers to unlock access to funding um, through the Afex platform. Why through the COMEX platform? Farmers can come on board with their commodities stored in the Afex, one of the Afex warehouses closest to them. And it will then be traded, um, purchased by investors on their platform and uh, either sold by the investors over when commodities prices picked up or when they are in need of money. So it, it shows you the trend on your dashboard based on the commodity that you are interested in, how the price for the day is going. So you can then make your decision either to sell or um, to still keep in holding. Now, in holding, you as the um, trader on the COMEX, you don't need to own a warehouse. You can then pay a rental fee on Apex warehouses or, uh, that is closest to you or you're comfortable with based on the pricing to then um, hold your commodity for the period of time before you sell off. Um, basically, it has helped the ecosystem and most manufacturers to have a better access to commodity and reduce their um, cost of holding of commodities in, in, on their balance sheets. So yes, they have stock with Apex, but it does not necessarily have to be recognized on their balance sheet because it is a tradable in, um, in, in their, in their uh, as a liability, but it's now as an asset because it's a tradable asset that can be converted into cash within the shortest period of time. So it's instead of holding stock um, in, in your, Instead of holding stock, huge stock as your inventory, it becomes an investment tool for you on your balance sheet. So a lot of manufacturing companies are more excited um, about what COMEX um, and Apex COMEX have done. And um, we, we also have Baron Coroli, which trade commodities on the stock exchange um, floor in Nigeria and they've really done well. They also provide um, spot pricing 
daily spot pricing across the different um, region depending on the on the commodity in itself. So would you say that these platforms have provided more stability and structure to the agriculture sector? And are you potentially seeing more investors because of this? Yes, I would say um, FX have done fantastically well. It has taken them a number of years, but they have been consistent and has um, created a lot of investors' confidence. I'd say there's been a lot of investment through the COMEX platform um, on, on commodities and a lot of trade has also occurred. APEX have also spread their tentacles beyond Nigeria to other African countries to also drive in the intracontinental trade between um, intracontinental commodity trades um, between um, in the agricultural space. So I would say yes, definitely it has brought a lot of structure uh, and also a lot of people refer to Apex and Varian Corolli spot pricing um, index to determine day rates for commodities, um, for the various commodities in that. Okay. Oh, that's that's great to hear. So you've mentioned in terms of these commodity platforms have brought more structure, stability, and investor confidence. Why do you think historically agriculture in Nigeria and Africa in general has been underfinanced in comparison to other sectors? Um, agricultural sector is what I call a volatile sector. It's a high risk sector. It has a very short shelf life. So contracts cannot be generated for agriculture, most agricultural products. And we do not have currently the structure for proper storage. More importantly, we do not have the data to back a lot of our claim. Monitoring is also a very Herculean business in, in Africa, not just in Nigeria. So you have very poor infrastructure access to the rural areas where a lot of agricultural activities take place. You have um, a lot of farmers who do not insure their crops. So when there's a flood or natural disaster, that's the end of that investment. Okay, true. Now, you also have the human risk index where the farmlands are owned by a single individual. And once the individual falls ill, then the farm suffers. Operations cease until the person is back on his or her feet again. Most of the, money, the funds that we have, they're investors' money. And investors want to get their money when they want, when they need it. So you cannot risk investors' money in that kind of volatile sector. However, with technology now, a lot of farmers are beginning to trust the insurance sector in Africa because we now have yield index policy that allows farmers to insure against the yield. So if they have less than a particular yield, due to some indices, then they can claim premium for it, which gives the financial institutions more confidence. A lot of financial institutions also are now doing using remote sensing to monitor um, farmers' activities in a way whereby they can provide um, extension services to these farmers at a cost that is embedded in their cost of financing without the farmers actually knowing that it comes at an extra cost because it's all encompassing in the cost of funding um, advanced to the, to, the, to the farmers. Data, again, when you cannot get concrete data on what is going on in the industry, it's difficult for you to plan and to project. However, 
in the recent times, um, financial institutions are beginning to find out, uh, find some kind of way, you know, in collaboration with the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics for Nigeria and other um, bureaus across other African countries to, to get some statistics, even though it's not adequate enough. Interventions from African Development Bank, AFRIEG Games, um, African Finance Corporation has also stimulated um, interest in financial institutions to extend facilities to the sector. With the new trend of um, guaranteeing schemes, I'd say we've been able to, we are beginning to manage um, the issue, the risk associated with non collateralization of credit. Most agricultural facilities, most agropreneurs do not have the asset to back as a security to back the fund that they want to raise. In Nigeria, you have it is it is a guarantee or a collateralized structure. Without that collateral, you cannot go ahead to fundraise in the traditional bands. However, with the new trend of guaranteeing schemes um, provided by African Guarantee Fund, um, InfraCredit, Impact, and other guaranteeing um, institutions, farmers can now have some 50 to 75% coverage and they just need to provide an equity of 25% or more depending on their risk assessment um, by the guarantors. So it also helps with access to funding now. But these are some of the things that prevented um, the access to finance but we are beginning to use both technology and new um, financing schemes to, to improve access to financing in the agricultural sector. Brilliant. You've touched upon the difficulties of accessing reliable data, also the peculiarities of agriculture in Nigeria that influence financing of agriculture. With that in mind, would you say that there is adequate funding available and do we have progressive and innovative funding solutions to support modern day agriculture and trade in Nigeria? I would say that um, there are vulnerable funds in Nigeria, um, both intervention funds from the government, development funds from um, multilateral agencies and um, structures that the central banks have put in place to drive the commercial banks to provide funding. With innovative, there's some organizations that have also provided and um, come up with innovative funding structures for um, the sector. Yes, I would say that uh, there's a lot of funds available. However, there also are a lot of um, organizations or businesses, agribusinesses in Nigeria that are not in bankable position. So there's one thing to have access to funds. There's another thing. There's one thing to have funds available. There's another thing to be ready uh, to have access to funds. Fantastic. You've said that there is funding available. If we look at, say, for instance, guarantee schemes, the Central Bank of Nigeria has developed different agricultural schemes through the years to sustain growth in the agriculture sector. Do you think that these schemes do enough to positively increase agricultural output? Um, they are never enough, but I think they have significantly um, improve the agricultural sector. Um, the policy on rice importation and the access to the creation of funds specifically to, to meet 
rice growers um, need has stimulated a lot of rice mills to, to spring up across the country. Most of the rice now consumed in Nigeria are locally manufactured rice. The same thing with the poultry industry, um, which is also forcing the government to provide a funding structure for um, maize farmers um, in Nigeria to support both the, the breakfast cereal um, industry and the poultry industry and other industries that depend largely on, on maize. And the, the, the central bank has also found a way. It's not enough, but like I said, it's significant. But they are now collaborating, intentionally collaborating with um, donor agencies and other multilateral agencies to drive the growth um, in the agricultural sector. We have not gotten it right, but I'll tell you that we have made um, some level of improvement in, in um, creating access to funds. For, but those are the bottom of the pyramid and um, small enterprises in Nigeria. Fantastic. So you've kind of mentioned the central bank's collaboration to increase access to funds and improve the general ecosystem within agriculture in Nigeria. Outside of that, what more can be done policy-wise to increase performance of, say, loans and agricultural sector output? Okay, so I'll say that a lot more can be done. The, the first thing we need to look at is the policies on inputs. We have a, a lot of struggles having access to inputs required for farming. Um, fertilizer, yes, there's a fertilizer policy currently in, in Nigeria that helps with access to fertilizer, but I think more can be done and um, to drive more inclusion of farmers onto the scheme. We also need a lot of seeds. Seeds are, are a bane. In, um, in, in fact, it's a serious issue in Nigeria. Access to seeds is, is a major challenge. We need a lot of collaboration um, between the government and um, seed multiplicators in Nigeria or even outside of Nigeria, but we need a lot of collaboration um, in, that, in that area, um, a lot of investments in that area. Because once the financial institutions can put together how farmers will have, assure farmers will have access to these inputs, then the willingness to lend to them, whether in the traditional way or innovative becomes higher. So in terms of policies relating to inputs in, in the primary agricultural sector, I believe we need to critically look at them. It goes beyond just having the fund, but also having um, access to the resources that is required um, to make that business successful or fully utilize the fund. And we need a lot of um, extension services. We are still struggling with that now. So we need policies that will improve access to extension services for farmers across the sector, whether as agronomic support or livestock support, whatever kind of support that they need to provide and bring technology or inputs closer to them so that they can then, then use inputs in the right way and also improve their yield, we need to look, start looking at those kind of policies because it is not enough to have a huge land mass in the country as an advantage, but it is critical to be able to utilize those farm lands in a way that provide us with the yield that is competitive 
globally. So in terms of inputs that we have, they are not adequate to enable us to um, compete favorably in terms of yield. Fantastic. Thank you. So you've discussed the struggles with inputs such as fertilizer and seeds. So over the last two years, we've seen supply chain struggle due to the COVID-19 pandemic. What has been the impact of the pandemic on agriculture in Nigeria? It's been... (laughs) (laughs) Do do we need an episode for that answer? Uh, I'll tell you a whole episode because... Ah, it's been terrible. It, it's been terrible. We're having a lot of crisis, I must tell you, um, okay. because of the breakdown in supply chain. We're having a huge crisis with food supply because a lot of inputs didn't come into the country. In fact, with this Ukraine-Russian crisis, we are going to have more crisis locally. A lot of our wheat comes from that region. Yes, and we use wheat. Nigeria is a bread and pasta consuming country. So, right, right, uh, yes. There's a huge problem in the ecosystem due to poor access to the commodities that are imported. So, there's a huge price hike across the food sector, be it the most staple of foods produced locally, because We still need some inputs that are not local to us. Those staple foods still have increased in price. We also have the challenge with uh, logistics locally. Um, During the lockdown, it was a very difficult period for a lot of people. And we had nutritional challenges, according to the study carried out uh, by the AFDB. Um, during the pandemic so uh, i'll say yes uh, we need a whole episode for that but we are having we're going through a crisis period but we will we will gradually find our feet hopefully we find our feet i believe so i believe so so you've detailed you know the struggles with supply chain and logistics during the pandemic in terms of getting inputs from outside of Nigeria, outside of Africa. Do you think this calls for more localization of inputs? And with that in mind, how important is an initiative such as AFTA in terms of its contribution it can make to agriculture in Nigeria and Africa? Um, I'd say yes, it calls for more local production and inclusion of those inputs. Um, That is why... Contact Agro that has been going through an R&D process for the last six years are beginning to approach the markets more confidently because the market is now more receptive to to their product that is manufactured in Nigeria. Yes. Um, um, seed multiplication that they do, um, um, stem multiplication and all of that is now um, tissue culture that they also carry out in Nigeria is now being um, welcomed positively. They are also, I, I know they're also working with other African countries to produce locally in Nigeria and supply to them because the distance between um, Nigeria and those other African countries are, are um, shorter co- as compared with um getting outside of the continent so there are a lot of collaborations that are going on a lot of restructuring locally um we're beginning to appreciate investments that speak to the needs of imputes um locally and and the i would say the government is also finding ways to subsidize the investments in a way that it becomes um competitive for for us to purchase these products, these inputs locally. With all of that, I would also say we would like to encourage more people to come and invest in these particular regions, um, uh, sector in Nigeria, um, talking about the seed 
um, biopesticides, biofertilizers, um, growth stimulants, and all of that, we'll say yes, we, we would like more um, people to come into Nigeria or Africa to invest in this um, sector. There's a huge market here, and it will it get better when you produce it locally as to when we import it, because there's a lot of bottleneck when it comes to importation, clearing, custom duties, and all of that. But with locally produced, then it becomes easier to access the market and you'll be able to speak to the needs um, of the market in a more specific way. Brilliant. So you touched upon seed and stem multiplication locally and also investment that appreciates local knowledge and needs. So outside of that, what other trends should we watch out for on the continent with regards to agriculture? Um, I would say a lot of commodity trading is something we need to look out for and encourage investors because of a lot of intracontinent trading is beginning to happen now. And the right time to invest in Africa is now because you have a huge, over a billion um, people market to look out um, and to feed because agriculture is one critical part in the life of humans that cannot be overemphasized. Everybody must eat um, and you are, we're always using um, one agricultural commodity or the other in our home. So I would say, Look at commodity trading. Look at that. That is one thing that is going to um, be a money spinning business. Um, innovations that disruptive innovations that will help improve um, movement of commodities within the continent is another thing we need to look out for. Um, for advocates and um, policymakers. Policies that will encourage um, intra intracontinental trade uh, as something that we need to also be mindful of, because it's one thing to have that beautiful piece of document put together and signed, but by all the nations, it's another thing for us to sensitize the minds of um, citizens in this. Um, country that it is important to trade with each other is important to you make a lot of money trading with each other rather than focus on the the the, the more distant market that will cost you um, more the shipping cost will be more and the other cost associated cost will be more you can have markets within um, within let's say West Africa where it is it is um, it is short haul rather than looking at a long haul um, transaction. So in, in in specific I would say look at commodities, trend in commodities, look at um, trends in, in advocacy, look at trends in, in artificial intelligence and in disruptive technology and um, funding as a role in the ecosystem. Those are the things to look up for. Okay, so you've nicely detailed some of the trends that we should look out for that will shape the future of agriculture in Africa. So from your perspective, where do you see Africa in five years' time from an agricultural point of view? I see Africa feeding itself in five years' time. Brilliant. Um, because the younger generation are more intentional about agricultural sector. You know, in the last five, six years, in fact, in the period of the pandemic, I saw more youth across Africa interested in the agricultural sector. Oh, wow, that's great. A lot of educational platforms that are geared towards agriculture saw a huge increase in the interest of youth in their courses and the programs that they run. A lot of people are more interested because they are seeing that they can now use 
um, artificial intelligence. Um, you see women in Nigeria are already flying drones mm -hmm. to do a lot of things in the agricultural sector. In Zambia, in Namibia, in Ethiopia, you see people below 30, people less than 25 are already in the, actively in the agricultural sector doing things that are um, way more improved than what we are used to seeing. Um, protective um, agriculture is, is a game changer that have come to stay in Nigeria and in Africa as well. Um, instead of using the traditional greenhouse that we, we, we adopted from um, other continents, we've seen how Africa has been able to create what works for them as a continent to provide their own protective um, horticulture um, locally in Nigeria, in Kenya, um, in South Africa, and, and the rest of, um, and some major crystal places in, in Africa. And these protective horticultural um, centers are mostly controlled by younger generation. And they are bringing the skills of technology into the ecosystem. And with that, we will see a, a, a shift, a paradigm shift um, from reliance into a, 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 um, a high level of self-sufficiency and to an extent, a high level of export. Because what they're doing is not focused on exporting commodities um, as, on, on its own, but putting value. They're focused on value addition on commodities that already exist that can be locally um, consumed. So you see um, a lady called, um, her business called Happy Coffee. She, she's been able to mobilize local coffee in Nigeria. We usually import a lot of coffee, yes. but now she has, she, she, she has mobilized um, the industry, the, the, the growers and the, um, the blenders to say, you know what, the toast, the roasters, the blenders, the growers, let us come together in a way that can we will organize ourselves to sell the coffee grown in Nigeria locally and make it um, a, a, a dominant factor rather than focusing on importing. During the pandemic, that changed entirely and a lot of people are beginning to look at the locally grown coffee as um, as a premium coffee rather than as an option. It's more of a choice than an option. So um, in the next five years, yes, Africa for me will be um, self-reliant because of the inclusion of a lot of youths and the interest of a lot of youths and women in the ecosystem beautiful so you gave a very encouraging and positive vision which i truly believe will be achieved africa being self-sufficient and africa feeding itself in five years time so if we bring it closer to home and from a more personal point of view where do you see yourself and agri verified in five years time in five years time i see myself championing um, verification service in the agricultural sector, um, data service in the agricultural sector, um, and AgroVerified being a, a, a go-to place in Africa for Africans by designed by Africans that other continents globally can trust as a transparency ecosystem for the agricultural system um, sector to build the food systems in africa wow brilliant and with the great work you've done so far i think you will definitely achieve that and even more thank you so much you're welcome quote of the week this is a feature which i've kept for each episode so 
Hopefully you have something that you can give us today. As people, we often have quotes, mantras. As Africans, we have African proverbs or affirmations that keep us going. When times are good or when times are hard, do you have one that you can share with us today? Yes, I have one. Fantastic. We are Ubuntu. Hey. We are who we are. And we are African. And I am a proud African. That is Nelson Mandela. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. And I don't think I could have closed or ended the conversation any better, but I want to ask you, do you have any closing remarks and final calls to action for people who are out there listening, who are interested in agriculture in Nigeria, agriculture in Africa? Any final calls to action? Yes, I would say that for everyone listening to this episode, please, before you invest in Africa, or in ag- the agricultural sector, do your investigation. Investigate before you invest. And the safest place to investigate is on AgroVerified. We will be glad to have you come and enjoy transparency and integrity in the ecosystem. Together, we will build a better Africa. We need you as our collaborator as Africa, in Africa. Thank you. Fantastic. So you heard it there. Investigate before you invest. Transparency and collaboration via AgriVerified. That has been an extremely informative and insightful conversation, Victoria. One that has been packed full of value. You've given me some food for thoughts and some discussion points that I'm going to try and explore further. So thank you, Victoria, for giving us your valuable time and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much, Tessa. It was indeed a pleasure speaking with you today. Oh, it's been a pleasure hosting you and we will speak soon. Bye for now. Thank you to everyone who has listened and stayed tuned to the podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, share or tell a friend about it. You can also rate, review us in Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast. Thank you and see you next week for the Unlocking Africa podcast.